In this video, we'll be talking about the most common infection in the world. Over half of the people on Earth carry this bacterium in their stomachs. This 52-year-old businessman, who lives in Vancouver and commutes between Canada and Tokyo, was one of the billions of people whose stomach is home to this remarkable microbe. Mr. Akamatsu made an appointment to see his family physician in Vancouver after six weeks of unusual stomach discomfort just below his rib cage in the middle of his abdomen. He also told his physician that he had been feeling nauseous almost daily and had lost his usual appetite for food. When he did manage to eat a proper meal, he experienced significant belching and bloating. He had lost a bit of weight too recently, and this was his primary concern and also the reason he had finally made time in his busy schedule to seek medical attention. Mr. Akamatsu's father had died two years ago from stomach cancer in Japan, and his father's early symptoms had been very similar to his own. Towards the end of the history taking, Mr. Akamatsu confided in his doctor that he often lay awake at night, terrified he was going to die of stomach cancer. Given this patient's history, including his family history, the physician strongly suspected that Mr. Akamatsu was suffering from symptoms associated with gastritis and perhaps a stomach ulcer. He decided to order several tests, including a CBC, to check for anemia, as ulcers can cause gastrointestinal bleeding. He also ordered a blood test for the antibodies to Helicobacter pylori, as well as a stool antigen test for H. pylori, and tests to assess the function of his liver, kidneys, gallbladder, and pancreas. The results of these preliminary tests suggested an infection with H. pylori, so Mr. Akamatsu was scheduled to undergo an endoscopy, which would allow the medical team to visualize his GI tract to look for evidence of gastric or duodenal ulcers, and to obtain biopsy specimens to confirm the infection with H. pylori, as well as making sure that there was no evidence of pre-malignant lesions or gastric cancer. H. pylori is the strongest risk factor for both peptic ulcers and gastric cancer, but in the majority of those infected, there are no symptoms, and H. pylori lives in the stomach as a commensal, despite causing inflammation at the microscopic level. It's a microbe that has evolved many strategies to survive in the stomach, and even to induce the immune system to tolerate it. Exactly how the microbe is transmitted between hosts is unclear, but transmission usually occurs in childhood, and in many developing countries, most children are infected by age 10. Unlike many other infections that spread through the environment, H. pylori requires close contact and is usually transmitted within families from mothers to their children or from one sibling to another. The infection most likely occurs through the oral-oral or gastric-oral route when microbes are regurgitated from the stomach into the mouth. Crowding and low socioeconomic environments are risk factors for transmission, which is one of the reasons why the prevalence of this infection is higher in under-resourced countries. Interestingly, H. pylori doesn't seem to survive passage through the intestine, and although antigens from the bacteria can be readily detected in stool, the bacteria can't be cultured from stool, so transmission in contaminated food through the fecal-oral route is unlikely. Once the bacteria have entered the host, they have to avoid being killed by the harsh acidic environment of the stomach. And amazingly, they persist throughout the lifetime of the individual because they've evolved several specialized survival strategies. The bacteria have tufts of flagella and a sensory chemotaxis system that allows them to navigate away from the acidic lumen of the stomach and burrow into the protective mucus layer lining the stomach walls. The stomach lumen contains hydrochloric acid with a pH that can be as low as 1, but the stomach mucus creates a protective buffering layer that prevents the epithelium from being destroyed. Here is where H. pylori hides. The microbe also protects itself from the acidity of the stomach by producing urease, a powerful enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. 
the alkaline ammonia neutralizes the acidic environment, conferring transient protection while the microbe finds its way to the epithelial surface. Once H. pylori has burrowed through the mucus lining, it senses metabolites from the epithelium that attract it, and when it comes into contact with the epithelial cells, it's able to adhere to these cells via specialized adhesion molecules on the microbe's surface. Once attached, the bacteria produce a pore-forming toxin called VAC-A that has multiple effects on the epithelium and the surrounding tissue. The more virulent strains of H. pylori also have a specialized microinjection needle called CAG, a type 4 secretion system that serves to poke the epithelial membrane and inject a microbial protein into the host cells. This protein called CAG-A is a powerful signaling molecule that affects the functioning of the epithelium. The presence of CAG-A has been strongly associated with increased risks of cancer in many studies. The presence of the bacterium in close proximity to the epithelium and the injection of CAG-A results in the release of cytokines that deploy immune cells like neutrophils and monocytes. The host immune response is responsible for producing the widespread inflammation that can result in many of the symptoms experienced by Mr. Akamatsu. H. pylori strains are genetically diverse and can vary in their pathogenicity. The human host also responds differently to the infection depending on the genetic background of the host and also environmental factors like diet or comorbidities like smoking are also important determinants for the severity of the gastritis and whether or not the gastric epithelium is likely to transform into precancerous and cancerous tissue. Gastric cancer is the third most common cause of cancer-related death in the world, and it remains difficult to cure even in the most advanced countries, mostly because patients typically present with advanced disease. Mr. Akamatsu's endoscopy provided his medical team with a great deal of information about what was causing his symptoms. In addition to widespread inflammation of the gastric epithelium, the gastroenterologist who performed the procedure visualized a single gastric ulcer that measured 1.5 centimeters in diameter in the region of the antrum of the stomach. During the endoscopy, biopsy specimens were taken from Mr. Akamatsu's gastric epithelium as well as the ulcer itself. Histological staining of the tissue specimens confirmed the diagnosis of gastritis secondary to infection with H. pylori, but there was no evidence of premalignant lesions or malignant transformation. In fact, most patients that develop antral or duodenal ulcers due to H. pylori usually don't go on to develop gastric cancer for unknown reasons. Mr. Akamatsu was started on triple therapy with a proton pump inhibitor to reduce the secretion of acid into the lumen of his stomach, as well as two antimicrobials to eradicate the H. pylori in his stomach. This was followed up with eradication testing using stool antigen testing four weeks after he had completed his course of therapy. Mr. Akamatsu's symptoms resolved, and he returned to his busy work travel schedule almost immediately. Knowing that the H. pylori in his stomach had been eradicated and that this was most likely the very same microbe that had caused his father's stomach cancer, Mr. Akamatsu was once again able to sleep through the night.